they keep us alive spiritually it is just a great thing to think through. Well, this morning, I want to ask you something. If you've ever had something that you've been involved in that maybe you didn't realize had an even greater and bigger purpose to it, and you labored in your little area and maybe didn't realize that it's part of this great, greater, bigger story that you didn't even know about. Uh, it happens frequently because sometimes we live life with such blinders on that we can't see anything except the little bitty part of the story that we're intimately and personally involved in. We don't, we don't sometimes mess with other people's responsibility. And it's hard for us sometimes to see how what we're doing here translates into bigger and better things. <clears throat> Many of you know I have two teenage boys. And um, I don't have permission to share this, so I, I, if anybody has lunch plans that you want to invite me, I may need to find someone else to eat with. Um, my, my teenage boys don't understand that when we are encouraging them to clean their room, make their bed, pick up after themselves, that it is not about the cleanliness of their room or they're making their bed. It's all about making them marriageable at some point in the future. Like, we don't want to unleash a disaster on some sweet lady. And so you need to understand that the clothes go in the hamper, not because those are house rules. Like, we are making you a more eligible bachelor with every little thing that we do. So those house rules are so important. And when you're a teenage boy... You don't get it. You just think it's about the clothes hamper or the bed or brushing your teeth or washing behind your ears. And I'm like, we want to bless some sweet, godly, beautiful young lady by, by trying to give her a, a, a sweet, godly, handsome, well-groomed, uh, able to take care of themselves, responsible young man at some point in the future. And so for a teenage boy... Those household instructions, when you've got the blinders on, seem like they don't matter at all for the future. And at some point when they celebrate an anniversary and, and, and their spouses are talking about how lazy their husbands are when it comes to all this stuff and they're not, there's, there's a great big blessing that comes that they probably won't realize until many years down the road that there's a much bigger picture at play when it comes to picking up after yourself and just learning how to be a decent human being that knows how to live with others in a responsible way. Well, here's, just, here's, here's the thing. <clears throat> so many people, when they hear the story of Nehemiah, think that the story of Nehemiah is simply a story about rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. And, and listen, up to this point, that's really been the focus. There's been a lot of focus on rebuilding the walls. Now, the, the truth is, from a social perspective, the rebuilding of the walls, the destruction of Jerusalem, cast shame and dishonor on the whole city. The city was incapable of thriving while they had no protection with the walls being done. But I can tell you, because I've, I've read the rest of the book of Nehemiah, Nehemiah's priority was never on rebuilding the walls. It was on rebuilding the people. His goal in the early chapters looked like it was exclusively built on this thing, the walls. But as we get to Nehemiah chapter 7 through 10, we see that it was not about the walls at all. It was about the people in rebuilding spiritual vitality because Jerusalem is not just a city. Jerusalem is the city of God. And how this city prospers is important. And so we're going to do a couple of things this morning, really two things in the way we kind of handle our sermon this morning. We're going to give you a very quick kind of historical overview of chapter 7, 8, 9, and 10. I'm not preaching on every detail in those chapters. I'm going to give you a quick kind of historical overview, give you a couple points to kind of Hang your coat on here a little bit. And then we're going to talk about what we learn from these passages about how to renew your joy in God. 
Now, I, I, I think that I have heard this correctly. That it uses far less muscles to smile than to frown. And sometimes when I come to worship on Sunday morning, I feel like God's people need to hear that. We want to talk about how to fill up our cup with the joy of the Lord. And it's hidden in these... De- it's actually, it's not hidden, it's there. We just don't see it sometimes in these instructions that God gives to us. So I'm, um, I, just, I, I pray that there is gospel encouragement for you this morning. There has been for me in preparing, and uh, I pray that there is for you in hearing and seeing from God's Word. So as we talk about an overview of these chapters, <clears throat> we see a transition beginning in chapter 7 from what I call wall work to people work. From wall work to people work. Now the truth is, I think for Nehemiah, the people work was always foremost in his mind. But he knew that the wall work, something physical, something practical, was a necessity before he could get to the deeper and more important work. Because I'll tell you, I'll tell you one thing. Guys, working on a wall is a whole lot, of e- whole lot easier than working with people. Rocks don't talk back. Rocks, rocks don't have attitudes. Rocks stay where you put them. You know, um, dealing with people is kind of like hurting cats. Like, you can't do it. They're just all over the place. And so, Nehemiah took, in one, one estimation, the easier job first. It was backbreaking. It was laborious. Uh, the, the city of Jerusalem had lived in this destructed shame for 150 years. And, and Nehemiah, in 52 days, less than two months, rebuilds the wall of a city. Now, think about building a wall around Rock Hill. That's not a simple and easy process. But they get done, and like it happens a lot of times with an with a event like this, you get done, you put that last uh, rock in place, and everybody wants to pat themselves on the back and go, job well done, now we can you know, sip, sip lemonade in our hammock and be done. And Nehemiah's like, oh, no, no, no. The, the work has really just begun. This was a foundational work that was necessary for the more important spiritual work. We've done the physical stuff. Now it's time for us to do the spiritual stuff. So we see this grand transition from wall work to people work. So let me give you a couple things to kind of hang your hat on when it comes to understanding the message through uh, chapters 7 through 10. Number one, Nehemiah completes the construction and commissions a census. He commissions a census. That's what happens in Nehemiah chapter 7. Uh, It's recorded in chapter 6, verse 15, that the wall was finished on the 25th day of the sixth month. So, uh, you know, if we were going by our calendar, that's June 25th. Sixth month, 25th day. Uh, And then as soon as he is done with this wall... He begins in chapter 7. Now, chapter 7 is a long list. It's not a genealogy, but it sure seems like it. It's this long list of people names and people who came back, uh, the returned exiles who were on an official list. They were on a kind of a manifest of people that were commissioned to come back to Jerusalem from uh, capture. And he pays attention to the census because he's trying to track down Where are all the people that were sent back to live in Jerusalem that aren't living in Jerusalem right now? And there's a huge, long name of people. And it begins to hint. Chapter 7, you sit and go, what's the use of this long list of, of names, this genealogy? Well, it hints at Nehemiah's ultimate goal. It's about the people, not about the project. As a matter of fact, the people are the project, not the wall. His goal, ultimately, is to see Jerusalem functioning, not just civically or commercially, but spiritually as the place that God would have it to be. His goal was a revitalized Jerusalem. So that's why, as soon as the wall work gets done, he commissions a census. Because it hints that his most ultimate goal is to repopulate the city and to see it functioning 
for the glory of God. Number two, in chapter 8, through the beginning of chapter 8, you see that this spiritual reconstruction of the people begins with God's Word. It begins with God's Word. Uh, that's exactly what he's doing. He's, before this, committed himself to a physical reconstruction of the wall. Now he is committed to a spiritual reconstruction of the people. And so you ask the question. You come to a demoralized and defeated people. What's the steps that you take to revitalize them? Well, listen with me to Nehemiah 8, 1 through 8. God's word says this. And all the people gathered as one man into the square before the water gate. And they told Ezra the scribe to bring the book of the law of Moses that the Lord had commanded Israel. So Ezra the priest brought the law before the assembly, both men and women, and all who could understand what they heard on the first day of the seventh month. Now, when did he complete the work on the wall? The 25th day of the sixth month. So the work has been done for maybe a week, because on the first day of the seventh month, the people tell Ezra, go get the word. That's what we need. We need the word. Verse 3, and Ezra read from it facing the square before the water gate from early morning until midday. Don't none of y'all complain about my sermon length. And he did it in the presence of the men and the women and those who could understand. And the ears of all the people were attentive to the book of the law. And Ezra the scribe stood on a wooden platform that they made for this purpose. And beside him stood Mattathiah, Shema, Anaiah, Uriah, Hilkiah. Good grief, there's a bunch of names here. Masaiah, and on his right hand, Pedaiah, Mishael, Melchijah, Hashem, uh, that guy, Zechariah. And Meshulam on his left hand. And Ezra opened the book in the sight of all the people, for he was above all the people. And as he opened it, all the people stood. And Ezra blessed the Lord, the great God. And all the people answered, Amen. Amen. Lifting up their hands. And they bowed their heads and worshiped the Lord with their faces to the ground, and all these guys and the Levites helped the people to understand the law while the people remained in their places, and they read from the book, from the law of God clearly, and they gave the sense so that the people understood the reading. There's so many things that are interesting about what Nehemiah is, is attempting in this spiritual reconstruction. Beginning in verse 1, I think it's very interesting that it's the people themselves that recognize their need. Have you ever tried to tell somebody what they need without them realizing that they need it? How's that conversation go? Not very far. And yet, maybe they had worked their fingers to the bone enough and their bodies were weary enough that their natural sinful defenses were down that they came to recognize, hey, we got the wall up, and that's good. But we're still who we were. We're we're a broken people inside a rebuilt city. How do we be a rebuilt people in a rebuilt city? And they begin to acknowledge something that is just so precious. They acknowledge their brokenness, and that the only solution to their brokenness is the Word of God. Let me just say, that's a recipe for success no matter where you're at in life, is to recognize who you are, namely not God, and who God is, namely God, and the gap that exists between the two and the solution that God provides. True worship always includes the word, repentance, and a recommitment to the sovereignty of God in your life. If, if you say you've worshipped and there's no word, there's no repentance, and there's no recommitment, you have had, you've gone to a concert, you've gone to a thing, you've gone to a gathering, but I don't know that you can say that you've worshipped. 
I love all of the many ways that they talk about their value for God's Word. And renewal always begins with God's Word. It says that the Word is proclaimed. And when it, I, I joked about sermon length, but the truth is what Ezra does here is likely five or six hours. What I love about it too is Nehemiah, who is kind of charged with being the governor, realizes that this work, as opposed to the wall work, is impossible for him to do by himself. We understand that there's a scribe by the name of Ezra who got to Jerusalem before Nehemiah got there. But Nehemiah was the leader to kind of assemble things because Ezra had been there and there hadn't been revival. There hadn't been renewal. But now you put Nehemiah and Ezra together and their efforts are quadrupled, which doesn't make sense because it's just two people. Nehemiah's work and Ezra's work is more than doubled because you have an an entire city that gets blessed by this team. And here's what's great. Ezra brings an entire group of people with hard-to-pronounce names to make sure that everybody is broken up into smaller groups for the express purpose of understanding clearly what God wants from them. Because it's not enough for Ezra to stay up there. That's good. That's an honoring of the proclamation of the word. But then this entire team of people is for the purpose so that people understand. And and this is is a huge thing. Because in, in one sense, all of us as disciples are like little kids. When you tell your children something and they hear you, but they don't listen. It goes in one ear and out the other. That's the chief problem with your discipleship. You know far better what you're supposed to do. You just don't always listen to it. You hear it. And so like they don't want people to just understand facts. They want people to understand. I love in verse 6 how it says that Ezra blessed the Lord. He, he wanted to say, hey, before we get into all of this, we want to we honor God. It says that the scriptures are explained, that the people listen attentively. And even more importantly than that, the people listen submissively. How do you gauge that? Like, Ezra had people who listened to him for five or six hours, and they listened submissively. So when I go home and I have lunch today and I talk about church with my family, can I say the same thing? How do I know that? Like, how do you know? Like, I can't, it's not like there's a transparent window and and I can see like your heart meter and whether you're in a submissive posture or not. There's there's a way, and and quite honestly, this this is probably not fair to say. But the decision on whether you came to church ready to hear God's word submissively was probably made hours ago. Probably before you got here. Like there's certain attitudes that you have. Like we don't, if your preparation for church is just a shower and a shave, it's inadequate. Like why would you not, why would you not pray for our assembly? One of the biggest changes, I think, over the last 50 years in church life is we are taught to think about church consumeristically, right? This is not a surprise to anybody, right? You have a list of things that you're looking for. And so the worship needs to be not just this, but it needs to be like, there needs, there's like eight different checklists that you've got for specifics. As a matter of fact, like if you come to church, and you can't freely worship with God's people because we're not singing your songs? You're worshiping yourself, and you're worshiping your own preferences. You refuse to worship God with God's people. Because if if I have to say this again, it is so not about you. It's not about you. It's about this glorious triune God that we serve. And I don't care if it's an old song or a new song. We want the beauty of what we're singing to resonate in our hearts. That's what makes us one. And yet, you know, I had, I had a lady. This is years ago. I've shared this illustration before. It was the strangest phone call that I ever got at the church from a prospective church visitor. I thought for sure I was being pranked. And um, she, she asked if we had a handbell choir. And I'm like, a handbell 
require. I don't, those two words don't go together for me. We have people that can do handbells, and we have done it on occasion. It's been a long time, but we've done it. What this lady wanted to know is if we had a standing handbell choir, which standing means like regular, like they're performing, not at Christmas or Easter. They're like almost every Sunday. I don't know a single church in America that has a standing handbell choir. So I made the mistake of kind of chuckling under my breath. I'm like, you mean like performing every week? And she says, that's what standing means. I said, I know what you mean. I was just trying to clarify. And when I said no, she said, thank you very much. Click. This is probably seven years ago. She's probably still looking for a church. <laughs> and like, you can, we can laugh at that. And I have, maybe inappropriately, but like, that is a microcosm of what people are looking for. I want what I want, and if you don't have it, I don't care. I do not give a rip. And yet, the way these people listened, where they, they came with their yes on the table. All right, God, I don't know what you're going to tell me today, but the answer for whatever you ask is yes. Yes. I'm not coming here to be entertained. I'm not coming here to check a box off. I'm not coming because I lived really bad, and I think if I go to church that it erases all the bad things that I did, and then I can live however I want again, and then I'll come to church next week to erase my badness. That's not what we do. We come to hear from God. We come to be encouraged by God's people. We come to be disciples. And the people listen submissively. Three, part of our overview, spiritual reconstruction requires a response. Spiritual reconstruction requires a response. Look at verses 9 through 12 of Nehemiah chapter 8. And Nehemiah, who was the governor, and Ezra the priest and scribe, and the Levites who taught the people, said to all the people, This day is holy to the Lord your God. Do not mourn or weep. Why do you think they had to give that instruction? Because they were mourning and weeping. And they're saying, no, 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 no. We are rediscovering God's word and we are valuing it. This is a good day. Don't mourn and weep. For all the people wept as they heard the words of the Lord. Then he said to them, go your way. Eat the fat and drink sweet wine and send portions to anyone who has nothing ready. For this day is holy to our Lord. And do not be grieved for the joy of of the Lord is your strength. So the Levites calmed all the people, saying, Be quiet, for this day is holy. Do not be grieved. And all the people went their way to eat and drink and to send portions and to make great rejoicing because they had understood the words that were declared to them. What's the response? Well, they listened to Ezra and his team Preach the word, explain the word, proclaim the word, and they are convicted and begin confessing. They they are repentant. They claim God's forgiveness and they learn to celebrate with joy. It's interesting because weeping applies equally both to confession and sometimes to joy. It's interesting. It's not a it's not a univocal emotion. Sometimes you weep because you're broken. Sometimes you weep just because God has given you joy. And then they obey. In verses 13 through 18, we find out that they discover in the word that God had said, hey, at this time of the season, you're supposed to live in booths. And so what do they do? They have a full festival. They have booths. So in uh, so the first 25th of June, our calendar, they finish the wall. First of July, they have this sacred assembly Uh, Middle of July, uh, the 15th of the seventh month, they have a fall festival, which is called the Festival of Booths, or the the Festival of Ingathering, which means they're celebrating, bringing in the harvest that God has provided for them. And they do something that they haven't done for hundreds of years. They obey the word, and they live in booths. They have a, a tent meeting. like They build booths. They live not in their houses. They obey. Fourth. chapters 9 and 10 tell us that 
cleansed people. They have listened to the word. They have responded to the word. They are cleansed people. Now they commit to future obedience. They, they are so overwhelmed with the joy of the Lord that they say, whatever we've not done in the past, we're not going to do that in the future. We're going to do what's right. As a matter of fact, we're so serious about doing what is right, we will sign our names to a document called a covenant and may God do to us what he needs to do if we don't obey. They call down fire from heaven because they are ready to be serious about their obedience. It is now the 24th of the seventh month, almost on the month anniversary of the wall being completed. In chapter 9, they have a massive praise and confession service. Uh, Chapter 9, if you're interested, verses 5 through 27 is a prayer, and the prayer is incredible because it basically rehearses all of Israel's history. They're like, God, you are so amazing. You made everything, every tree, every bird, every fish, every animal, red and yellow, black and white. They are all precious in your sight. You have made it all. You are so amazing because you called our father Abraham. And even though he was childless, you promised to make him Uh, give him a progeny greater than the sands of the sea. And here we are today, from nothing, you've created this people. And you heard our affliction when we were in Egypt, after we suffered in slavery for hundreds of years. And you, sovereign God, not any person, not another nation, you, God, rescued us. You caused us to go through dry land, through a sea. You destroyed the armies of Egypt that were pursuing us. You've brought us into this and. Credible land where you meet with us by pillar and by cloud and you meet with us in the tabernacle and you've given us this great land. You've allowed us to conquer all of these nations and kings. You are such a good God. Chapter 9, verse 16. But they and our fathers acted presumptuously and stiffened their neck and did not obey your commandments. They rehearse all of God's incredible blessings and all of their rebellion and its consequences. And God, despite all of these crazy ways that you've been good to us, we and our fathers have not obeyed. And now we find ourselves slaves. And we find ourselves in this situation. You, God, are great and overflowing in mercy. But despite your goodness to us, Father, we rebel and we deserve all of the consequences that we have received. In chapter 9, verse 38, after this incredible prayer, confessing and praising God, chapter 9, verse 38, talks about what they did. Because of all this, we make a firm covenant in writing. On the sealed document are the names of our princes, our Levites, and our priests. And in chapter 10, they write a covenant. Chapter 10, verses 1 through 27, is the list of all of the heads of the city that sign it. And in chapter 10, just 11 verses, verses 28 through 39, the obligations of the covenant are laid out. Now, I would encourage you in your notes, write down Nehemiah 10, 28 through 39. It would be good for you to read this. The, the, the obligations are um, really twofold. There's one general commitment, and then there's three specific commitments. The general commitment is just a commitment to holy obedience. God, yes. What do you want? Yes. We, we want to do everything that you say you want us to do. This is, this is the heart response of somebody who's in love with God. Like, I, I don't even know. Like, it, it's, it's standing at the altar, love. You know, nobody standing at the altar really knows what they're committing to for the long haul. You don't know what the highs and the lows are. You just know you love this person. And you are committing till death do you part to to do whatever you need to in sickness and in health. And you don't really understand what kind of check you're cashing at that moment. That's the beauty of married love. And that's what's happening here. God, we love you so much. We are willing to do whatever you want. But then they have three specific commitments that are really interesting. And and I, I have kind of classified these three commitments as their home life in verse 30 their commercial life in verse 31, and their religious life in verses 32 through 39. 
When they say, God, we're going to obey you, and here's how. Let's spell it out. Let's be specific. Let's have some targets. In our home life, we're not going to give our kids to be married to pagans anymore. Because we've seen what that's done to us in the past. When we marry their daughters, our sons don't worship Yahweh anymore. So we're done. We, we are not encouraging. We, we are going to keep our home life pure. In their commercial life, they say, hey, we're going to honor the Sabbath. There is no more buying or selling on the Sabbath. Because we have forsaken worship enough that we're, we're done. We're, we're going to make a commercial break not like a television break, a commercial break by not engaging in things on the Sabbath so that we can focus on what we need to. And then in verses 32 through 39, they talk about their religious life. They have neglected the tithes and offerings, which it's interesting. They go through all of these specific gifts that they're supposed to bring. And let me give you a hint. It's not just a Sabbath offering. They have sin offerings that whenever they sin, they show up at church and they give the offering. They are giving tithes and offerings all week long because they have neglected worship. And if they're going to give in this day and age, they had to go to the place where they give, the temple or in the, in, uh, the wilderness wanderings, the tabernacle. And so they are recommitting to their giving and their worshiping. So you ask the question, how in the world does this historical lesson help us know how to renew our joy in God? Well, lend, lend me your ears again just for a few minutes. Five simple but important points. And, and there's a part of me that wants to apologize for how simple this is. It, it is if I can say it this way, stupid, simple. Stupid, simple. And, and I, say, I say that to you not to belittle God's word, not to belittle my preparation, not to belittle your hearing. Um, I say it's stupid, simple, because if you find yourself missing the joy of the Lord, it's not hard to get. If you don't have the joy of the Lord, it's because you don't want to. Is that a mean thing to say? It's truthful, right? If you don't have it, and listen, that's not to make light of terrible circumstances you may be in or you have experienced. Because listen, God is sovereign over the most terrible experience you have had. I don't know his design or plan for why you've been through what you've been through. But I do know God is in charge. And God brings beauty from ashes. God fixes our sin. And he, he, he takes even ways that we've contributed to our brokenness. And he uses it for his glory. So here's what we can glean from, from a historical lesson. In Nehemiah 7 through 10 about renewing your joy in God. Number one, hear and heed God's word. First and foremost... Listen, like your life depended on it. Hear it. And don't just hear it, heed it. I love the way it says it in Nehemiah 8, 13. It says, on the second day, remember on the first day of the seventh month, they get together for this five or six hour long sermon. On the second day, the heads of father's houses of all the people with the priests and the Levites came together to Ezra the scribe in order to study the words of the law. So as if a five or six hour sermon was not enough, every male leader in Jerusalem goes to Ezra on Monday morning in our calendar and says, uh, you got anything else for us? What, what else can we learn? They didn't go, hey, that one sermon yesterday was enough for us for the whole week. Like, what else do we need to know that we've not been doing right? How do we measure our life against the plumb line of God's word, and figure out what we need to do. It goes on in, in verse 14, our second point. Eagerly do what God commands. Eagerly do what God commands, verse 14. And they found it written in the law that the Lord had commanded by Moses that the people of Israel should dwell in booths during the feast of the seventh month. Well, this is weird. 
God's like telling us stuff to do that doesn't have to do with what we do when we gather for church. We have to go do something like outside of church time and we have to live in it. We have to build our own house and live in it for a week. And yet there's no sense of drudgery or displeasure at doing what God commanded. There's an eagerness. There's, there's a happy-hearted obedience. Number three, you want to know how to renew your joy in God, hear and heed God's word. Eagerly do what God commands. Number three, joyfully help obedience spread. This is a missing ingredient when it comes to our discipleship because most of us are content to check the box for ourselves. I have obeyed. I'm good. You're not good if you're not helping other people be good. There, there is a way. You don't just want to obey. You want everyone you love to obey because what's the Bible say? Trust and obey, or the song, for there's no other way to be happy in Jesus. An unhappy, um, somebody who practices unhappy obedience is not practicing obedience. It's not obedience. God doesn't want to look like he sucked the life out of you to make you do what he commands you to. It, it should emanate from a place where our heart genuinely wants to do what God wants us to do. So in verses 15 through 18, they joyfully help obedience spread. It says, they proclaimed and published in all their towns and in Jerusalem, go out to the hills and bring in branches of olive, wild olive, myrtle, palm, and other leafy trees to make booths as it is written. So the people went out and they brought them and they made booths for themselves, each on his roof and each in their courts and in the courts of the house of God and in the square at the water gate and in the square at the gate of Ephraim. And all of the assembly of those who had returned from the captivity made booths and lived in booths. For from the days of Joshua the, son, Joshua, the son of Nun, to that day, the people of Israel had not done so. And there was very great rejoicing. And day by day, from the first day to the last day, he read from the book of the law of God, and they kept the feast seven days. And on the eighth day, there was a solemn assembly according to the rule. Not a single person disobeyed. That's a goal for next week. No disobedient people. Heed whatever it is God wants you to. If it's improving your prayer life, if it's spending time in the Word, if it's sharing the gospel. Number four, you want to know how to renew your joy in God? I love this. This is all through chapter 9 in the prayer that they pray. Remember your personal and providential relationship with God. Remember your personal God's not just an abstract thing up there. He's personal and providential towards you. Now, again, you may be coming out of a storm where you do not have the distance to, to look back faithfully because storms shake you up and they mess with your perspective. But when you get beyond that, that period of bitterness or dealing with whatever it is that you're dealing with, you can look back on the darkest days of your life and still recognize the goodness of God. You can look back and say, what others meant for evil, God meant for good. I was crushed, but I was not destroyed. I was persecuted, but I didn't get put out. God is good. And you have the opportunity to look back and see personally how God has been good to you all the days of your life. Fifth and finally, when they made their uh, covenant commitment in chapter 10, specifically the obligations listed in verses 28 through 39. How do we renew our, our joy in God? We celebrate with a renewed commitment to faithfulness. God, we've been unfaithful. But today, hear our heart. We want to obey. Now, there's all kinds of problems with that statement, God, because the heart's deceitfully wicked. And I know I might not, but I want to. And that's what worship is about. Celebrating the goodness of God revealed in His Word in a commitment to be obedient in the future in ways that we've not been obedient up to this point. I love this. Because we begin to see 
the master plan, or should I say the master's plan for what God was doing with Nehemiah. It was far more than a construction project. It was rebuilding people to be genuine worshipers of God and the gospel encouragement that comes from remembering who God is and the role that he wants to play in guiding and directing and encouraging every moment of every day to be made in self-conscious reflection of what it means to live as a child of God. Oh, friends, there's encouragement there. They prayed, God, clean us up because we can't do it ourselves. And uh, we will conclude this morning by having the opportunity to sing in prayer to God. God, clean us up. Would you pray with me, please? Father, thank you for your word. And thank you that you love us so much that you want all of us to understand that there are ways that we live that will put a smile on our face and, and please and honor you. And there are ways that we choose to live that aren't good for ourselves and do not please you. So I pray that you help us to examine our obedience. I pray that you help us to examine our love for you because those two things are inextricably tied together. Father, help us to love you more and help us to demonstrate our love for you by how we obey you with joyful hearts. Father, I pray for all of my brothers and sisters here today that you will renew their joy in the Lord because there is no joy to be found anywhere else. And I pray that you convict us of that today in Jesus' name.